two, or what's the third one? I can't probably wear a face covering. When you're out in public and with groups of people, make sure that you cover your face with a, a face covering so that you can keep yourself and keep other people healthy. So those are the three opportunities. Face, uh, hand washing, face coverings, and social distancing. And by if each of us exercise those three behaviors, then perhaps we can welcome back even more students than we anticipate in the fall. All right, Dr. Nanez, first of all, thank you for spending a few minutes with us this evening. I know you'd much rather, you'd rather be somewhere else <laughs> than, other than sitting uh, in the living room tonight. Uh, so we appreciate this opportunity. Uh, two days ago, our Board of Trustees approved a calendar for the upcoming school year. And a couple of words about the calendar. First of all, thank you, uh, parents and, and staff members, for uh, contributing your feedback to that calendar. In fact, we had over 1,000 parents that contributed feedback and over 600 staff members. So lots of people had thoughts and opinions about the calendar. Uh, the majority of our community and the majority of our staff members supported the calendar as proposed. And so that is what our Board of Trustees adopted uh, on Tuesday night. But there was one line of questioning uh, that, uh, that we did respond to. So based upon your feedback, we did make one adjustment to the calendar, and that adjustment had to do with virtual days. We recognized pretty quickly that there was a lot of confusion as to what a virtual school day was. Uh, many people thought that the four virtual school days would be the only virtual days that we would have next year, and we do not anticipate that to be the reality. So what we did was we eliminated the four virtual days and then added four regular school days. So if you look at the new calendar, which was adopted on uh, Tuesday night, you will see that we have 180 uh, student school days during the next calendar year. Whew. Dr. Nanez, that's a big change from what we proposed just a few months ago. So why don't you walk us through some of the big changes in the calendar? So typically, our academic year here at Ector County ISD um, has or we carry 169 instructional school days mm -hmm. for students. Um, but because of COVID-19 and all the research that we've been seeing and hearing, you know, we always worry about the summer slide. Mm -hmm. And that's usually, you know, the weeks, you know, the two and a half months that we uh, enjoy, students enjoy their summer yeah. break. And we always address the summer slide. But with COVID-19, we knew that, that um, the slide or the gaps that we were going to be seeing with students was going to be so much bigger than the typical summer slide. So summer slide, I actually like slides myself. So <laughs> all the slides that kids are, is that the kind of slide we're talking about? That's or? not the kind oh, of slide okay. we're talking about. We're talking about the regression that students, um, mm -hmm. some students yeah. experience with uh, academics, with mm -hmm. reading, their reading comprehension skills, their math mm -hmm. skills. Um, that's what we're referring to when we say summer slide. It's that student regression that we see typically sure. from the end of school in May to yep. the beginning of school in late mm -hmm. August. Yes, yes, yes. So the research that we've been seeing with regards to COVID-19, um, uh, we're seeing that children will see such greater gaps or that we're going mm -hmm. to see greater gaps with students when they return to school in August. We're, cons we're, um, we're seeing that the gaps are going to be larger in the area of mathematics and, and more so in the younger grades. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, when we were looking and considering revising our calendar, it just made sense to add more academic days to the school calendar so we could build in um, what we call um, spiral in some of the skills and concepts that students might have missed uh, mm -hmm. during school closure. So our kids next year will have 11 more academic days during the calendar uh, than we had this past year. Yes, sir. So okay. we've actually gone from 169 um, a days for students, instructional days, to 180. Good. And that's actually a win-win situation oh, for us. Okay, because? Uh, well, because as we know, with House Bill 3, mm -hmm. um, when we or any school district has 180 instructional days on their academic calendar, mm -hmm. we actually qualify for 30 half-day additional school days for elementary students mm -hmm. in Good. June and July. So we're able to leverage that. So as I look on the calendar then, those when I, next June and July, uh, so June and July of 2021, I see some purple and some green. Those are those uh, 
elementary days required or optional? They are optional. Okay. They are optional. So it was a half days. So half day. So as an elementary kid, I not only could get 180 days this school year, but additionally, I could have 30 more days next year. And if my math is good, that's 210 days of school. That would do a lot to help an elementary student not only catch up, but potentially get ahead. Absolutely. And that's our goal. Yeah. We don't want to consider the, or we're not going to consider these days as uh, typically how we've done summer school in the past. We are looking at acceleration. This is one of uh, the philosophies that we've adopted yep. as a school district yep. is that we're going to accelerate um, instruction for students. Good. I think you're actually doing that in the, the month of July. Yes, so, sir. Okay. Got lots of kids that we'll see in July. They'll be accelerated to hopefully get them ready for the upcoming school year. Good. That's correct. Good, good. So we've added 11 days. We've added an opportunity next summer or our elementary kids to extend their school year, again, which is optional for students. What other types of adjustments did we make to this calendar? Anything else? We well, should? we also want to remind our secondary students that we will provide that opportunity in June for any students that need to uh, catch up on some credits. So that will continue um, for the students as well at the secondary so, level. So secondary kids will also, middle school, high school kids will have opportunities next summer as well to continue their learning. So next year, next summer is going to be a busy summer for yes. kids in ECISD, and that, that's good for them. It'll help us maybe catch up from a little bit of the stuff that we missed during remote learning. So there's there's something else on here uh, that, that I've noticed that is new. We, we have always had bad weather makeup days. Sometimes, and I've discovered even in the desert, we can have some bad weather that causes us to miss school. Um, I think we had a little bit of that white precipitation this year which is a bit unusual. Um, but we've got COVID-19 makeup days as well. What is a COVID-19 makeup day? Well, we're handling those very similar to how we've handled our bad weather days in the mm -hmm. past. Um, we wanted to have some opportunity for flexibility in case we have a campus or district-wide, we have to close school due to COVID-19. Okay. We will have that opportunity and that flexibility to utilize these yep. days very similar to how we've done the bad weather days in the past. So uh, a big change you'll notice is that we mm -hmm. do have two of those days identified in the month of November during the Thanksgiving week. You mean you've taken away my Thanksgiving break? <laughs> no, we didn't take away your Thanksgiving break, but we want we needed that flexibility in case we have okay. um, you know, campuses or, or we need to shut down yeah. um, for two days, we can make those days up. And not extend the school day at the end, at the school the yeah. school year at the end of, of the school the year. School so, year. in other words, going to school in June, we'd yes. rather do it in November than June. Yes. So, right now, we're for the week of Thanksgiving. We we actually have vacation for five days. That's the plan. So, and we hope that we don't have to use those days. That's our hope. That's, That's our right. hope. Okay. All right. So, as long as we stay healthy, so as long as we're washing our hands, wearing face coverings, and staying six feet apart. We might be in really good shape to have a one-week Thanksgiving. So that's the goal. That's the goal, okay. and it's up to us. Good. Yeah, it is definitely it's up, up to us, us and to you, good. parents, students, and teachers. All right. So if I still have questions about the calendar, wh where would I go? Who, who would I ask about the calendar if I still have questions? Um, well, you can uh, uh, email um, ECISD. Um, you can email uh, me. Uh, Lilia Nanez. Um, my email is on the website, but our PR office also handles um, uh, any questions that our parents may have regarding the calendar or any other issue that we have. Good, good, good. All right. Let's move on. So we have a calendar now. We at least know the first day of school. We know the last day of school. We kind of know the logistics. And, and I think the next piece of this is what happens during those days? There's a lot of work happening right now in ECISD. I, I know that Dr. Howard has uh, put together a large number of people, you know, moms and dads and kids and uh, teachers and administrators working on uh, this, the task of opening of schools. And I believe you lead one of those subcommittees. So talk about what happens next. What is the work that you're engaged with with your team? Well, uh, the team that I'm leading is the instructional design team. And so what we are engaged in currently is we are, we are designing frameworks, uh, a framework for virtual learning uh, or remote learning, and a framework for um, the face-to-face. -face. Um, so as, as we receive um, 
you know, criteria and information as to how we can um, uh, ensure that students are in attendance, you know, we're building those uh -huh. things that the uh -huh. state is asking us to okay. include uh, within the frameworks for face-to-face -face and for the remote learning. Um, we do want all our parents, families, and students to know that we will have a combination of both face-to-face -face and the remote okay. learning. Okay. So the scheduling team is working on, you know, designing schedules for the children, the students, uh, when they return, how they return. Uh, we're prioritizing uh, sort of student groups for face-to-face. Mm -hmm. -face. But we do want all families to know that the remote learning opportunities are, are going to be different from what you experienced during COVID school closure in the spring. Yeah, so first I have to commend uh, you and your team. You know, in the month of March, we literally found out we were gonna close over a long weekend. In fact, I, I remember I was it was spring break and I was in Marfa standing, I think, in the middle of the street. And I got a phone call and, and things started to spiral quickly. So I hopped in the car and drove back to Odessa and reached out to many of, of members of our leadership team and work began very quickly to create a remote learning experience when kids came back literally that Monday morning or when school returned. They didn't come back, but they returned. So thank you to you and your team for doing that work. But you said it's going to be different. So how would remote learning this fall be different from the spring? So we did have to put those uh, plans together very quickly. Uh, what's going to be different this year is that the, our framework is going to um, uh, include teachers provide uh, real-time instruction through a virtual setting. Okay. So parents are not going to have to be the teachers for the students. We will have teachers assigned to students and students will be able to log in to a live uh, virtual classroom um, on a daily basis if needed or however those schedules uh, roll out. So let me stop you there. It's probably breaking news for moms and dads. Did you say parents would not have to be teachers next year? <laughs> that's correct. Wow, that, that's good. That's a huge change because I know many of our moms and dads were activated, not only parents, but grandparents and aunts and uncles and siblings uh, were activated to be teachers during the spring. And, and, and we want to kind of flip the script and put our teachers kind of back uh, in charge, if you will, of, of the, uh, the, the teaching and learning of our kids. Good. That's correct. So we're actually working on our schedules to um, provide the training that is necessary for all our teachers. Um, they're going to uh, uh, really learn the framework uh, for the remote learning, um, and we're going to use the same platform okay. for the virtual classes, so we're excited mm -hmm. about that. So we're I'm kind of monitoring some questions in chat. One of them uh, deals with our uh, two of our high schools. That are, we have two high schools that are on the Odessa College campus. And they operate different, they have a different calendar and they offer a different schedule. So why are they different from the rest of the school district? Well, we want to make sure that because they are engaged, the students that are enrolled in OC Techs and our OCA campuses, mm -hmm. they, their teachers um, are also the college professors. Okay. And so we have to be in alignment with the Odessa College um, calendar. Okay. And so they engage with their professors online already, Monday through Thursday. So that's why we do have a separate yeah. calendar for those two campuses, because that they are in alignment with Odessa So OC Techs and OCA in direct alignment with the calendar, the academic calendar of Odessa College. And that's why their calendar would be different. That yes. makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit more about hybrid for just a minute. We've used that word quite a bit. What, what does that mean? And maybe as you talk about what it means, what might it look like in a school setting? Okay, so hybrid really means that we're going to have a combination of face-to-face -face instruction and remote learning. Okay. Um, so we've got a group, you know, several committees that are working on um, prioritizing student groups. And when you think about the research, you know, we think about the importance of the pre-K through second grade children yep. they really need that face-to-face -face instruction so part of our hybrid plan is that we are going to prioritize pre-k2 students to come to school and we're going to uh, educate them face-to-face -face okay. in a very safe way but we know that we have to teach them face-to-face -face. good all right so our, we will pay a lot of attention to ensuring that our pre-kindergarten through second grade students are in school physically in school 
um, every single day or most every day or have we um, we're we're working on schedules okay. you know uh, one of the subcommittees is a scheduling committee okay. and so we're looking at schedules because transportation we want to make sure that okay. when we provide transportation we're transporting children safely we're not loading up those buses with a with a bunch of children that we are spacing them out yeah. um, safely so so um, you know the social dis distancing rules and recommendations are are adhered to so um, we are looking at possibly doing four hour six hour uh, okay. face to face with the pre-k through second grade okay. children and then um, rotating a combination for upper grades okay. to do a combination of face-to-face -face and remote learning. Okay, hence hybrid. So it's a hence combination hybrid. of face-to-face, -face, which would occur at school, and then remote learning, which would occur at home. Yes, but um, the remote learning, remember, okay. uh, parents, still, that, that will be teacher-led. Still have teachers. So even yeah. though I'm at home, I'll still have access to a teacher, and a teacher will be instructing me. Okay, yes. good, good, good. So who else? You said we're going to pay special attention to pre-K through two. Um, are there other groups of students that we're going to pay a bit more attention to? Yes, we're going to pay attention to the, the children that might not have um, access to the internet during COVID closure, school closure. So we want to make sure that in some parts of our city, um, internet access is a struggle. Okay. Um, so we're going to invite those children to school to have face-to-face -face experiences. Okay, good, good, good. Um, another group that we're focusing on, in on are our English language learners. Okay, all right. Um, we're also going to focus in on some of our special ed population. Good, good, good. So there are some groups of kids that may physically be more be present more often than others. Yes, sir. Our pre-K through two kids, or elementary kids in general, yes. but specifically pre-K two. Um, our special education students, our English learners, and our kids of poverty, um, and maybe kids that did not have a good remote learning experience, because we know that the last three months for some of our kids was not healthy, and those kids may need some more of our attention as well. That's ab um, yeah. absolutely right. So yes. one, one of the, the specific questions, and we're, we're talking at it, but I guess just to clarify, just point blank, we serve 34,000 kids. Right now, do we think that all 34,000 kids are going to be at school every day, Monday through Friday? No, sir. Okay. Um, it's just yep. not the safe thing to do. Correct. Um, yep. But all 34,000 children will, uh, will attend school either virtually or face-to-face. -face. So that's, not the, all that's the message, yes. is, is we will be in school Monday through Friday, um, and school will be in session, but not every child will physically be present in a school building next year um, and for a variety of reasons. One actually is because we've already been contacted by many parents that have said they don't want to send their kids to school next year. Uh, they may not feel comfortable with that and they would like to uh, continue to have their kids educated at home and you know as a public school system we're still responsible for that and I've heard you mention virtual so we will be offering virtual learning for all children pre-k through 12th grade next year that and, and so families will have that choice whether or not to send their kids to school or not so if a child is eligible to come to school a parent can still opt to keep their kid at home and they continue to be educated but the simple answer will 34,000 kids be in our physical buildings next year the answer is no uh, we do not anticipate that at all we fully anticipate that some kids will be learning at home at the same time that some kids will be learning at school and that's really what hybrid is right. it's a it's a mixture of both um, so I've got so will there be uh, evening classes or schedules for working parents we've talked about that in fact I think one of the things we've actually talked about is we have uh, some of our students that actually are working some of our high school students in our current reality um, are the only working member of their family moms right. and dads have lost their jobs but the high school student still maintains their job and we have some high school kids that will need to continue to work next year. And, and we do hope to offer some evening opportunities for kids. You wanna? Yes, talk? so we're already doing that with our current okay. summer school. All right. um, so for our high school students, we offer some evening opportunities uh, so they can log in and do some credit recovery. So it's just going to be the work of the scheduling committee um, that will enable us to offer some uh, evening opportunities for some of our secondary students. In fact, we also have to consider that for our elementary students because sometimes 
you know, the, the cell phone and all the technology are with the parents at work. And so um, it, there may be time that, you know, children won't have access to uh, technology until parents do get home. So we will have some flexibility. Yep. Um, we also plan on recording teachers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they will have lessons that they will be recorded and loaded up onto the Seesaw platform or the Google uh, classroom platform that students will have access to. Good. So at those times, if a, if a student is working, that high school kid that might be working during the day, uh, that teacher may record on video their lesson, and so the high school student could actually watch that lesson at night and yes. engage in, in conversation. Um, and I think I also heard you say, so not only have we expanded horizontally um, the, uh, the school year, but we've expanded it vertically as well, uh, morning, noon, and night. So there could be opportunities for kids to continue the learning process at night. That's right. Um, yeah, I think that's a great way to accommodate parents in which that may be, that might be the best time for some of our families to engage in the learning experience. So that really tr changes the traditional eight o'clock to three o'clock Monday through Friday school environment. That that is absolutely yeah. right, um, and that's really one of the benefits that we've we've learned um, with the technology and school closure. We have so many more opportunities to share uh, instruction with students because of the technology resources. So some questions about class size. Um, you know, right now because of social distance, even you, you and I are sitting at a, at a distance right now. As we think about the learning environment next year, you know, we are. We, we've got to maintain a level of social distance. As I've walked around many of our classrooms in, in the current environment, there are some pretty, they're pretty crowded spaces. And yes, so as we think about class size next year, uh, we'll, what, what do you think that's gonna look like? Well, um, we've been working with operations, um, our division of operations, okay. and they are giving us the average class size for the elementary buildings and the average class sizes for the secondary yep. buildings. And so we know by square feet um, how many children we can fit mm -hmm. safely in, in the classroom environment. Yeah. So at, at the moment, the average class size in the, in the elementary building is 16 children. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and at the secondary, it's 13. Mm -hmm. So we're using that as, as a guide, but mm -hmm. then we're also um, asking our custodial head, head custodians to go in and and measure and make sure that that square footage that we see on the blueprints um, actually is the floor space where we can yeah. actually uh, socially distance the kids safely. So it's similar to actually what we're seeing in our restaurants right now. In fact, today I, I went to lunch with several colleagues here in this building and we were sitting at a distance. You know, the tables in the restaurant were separated. Uh, the restaurant had actually posted its maximum capacity on the screen and, and that was interesting and so our classrooms may look very similar not as many students in a classroom and the students may be seated uh, quite quite far apart you know that maintain right. that six feet of distance um, so that's interesting um, question about technology uh, you know that we, we did some exciting things in the last three months uh, to address the needs of our students in fact we, we purchased over 10,000 new devices uh, just for students in ECISD over the last few months so a question um, that we're seeing is about students having access to technology. What, what might that look like next year? If, if they don't have it, could they get it? Yes, absolutely. Um, because we have purchased so many additional Chromebooks and other types of devices for the students, we definitely will be able to um, check out yeah. uh, devices for families that need additional. Yeah. And you know, that's very important because if, if a family chooses to stay at home and they have three or four children at home, one computer may not be enough. Yeah. So then we're able to check out those devices to families. Absolutely, and so here I say that tonight. You know, ECISD, we have enough uh, tools, enough technology uh, to support the learning of our students. And if you are a family of four children, uh, we do not expect um, a, one device to serve the needs in a home of four kids. And you know we will ensure you as, as students and, and as family members, if you need four devices, then you'll have four devices. We have the tools in place to provide for every single student at ECISD. We know that some of our kids like to use their own uh, personal devices and that's fine. Kids Absolutely. are welcome to do that. But we also provide devices for kids, any kids that have a need. So that, that's good, good for our system. Um, some other, uh, how will assessment be conducted for those that are all online? So, you know, we've heard um, 
um, the scenario, we, we, we are exploring some online you know, testing. We've seen the College Board deliver the SAT and the ACT now in an online format. We saw our advanced placement. The College Board delivered advanced placement exams. So if, if a child is learning virtually, what, what does assessment look like if a kid's only learning experience is virtual? So that's a great question. Um, so what we're going to be doing is providing uh, professional development for our teachers that will enable the teachers to make assignments through the content platforms. So for example, if I'm an ELAR teacher at K, uh, at the kindergarten through fifth grade level, um, I will learn how to assign an online test or even just an online assignment, a homework assignment, uh, to the students through the digital platform and put it into the Google Classroom. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how sophisticated technology has become. Yes. And, and even we've learned a lot over the last few months um, about uh, tools that we were even unaware. Um, in fact, you know, Zoom is, is, <laughs> is now becoming a very popular tool in a lot of environments, not only for social interaction, but a lot of our teachers and, and students have used uh, you know, that tool and other tools uh, to, to make learning experiences uh, a bit more effective for them. Um, so what, another question about keeping uh, children at home. We've said we will offer virtual learning experiences pre-K through 12th grade next year. Um, does a parent have to notify us of that or is there a time for, have, have you, has your committee talked about that or is that another group? That is another group. Okay. That, that's right. a scheduling group, but we okay. all, you know, will come okay. together on uh, Thursday uh, afternoons to talk about the decisions that are made uh, with each within each subcommittee. Okay. Um, so, you know, parents will definitely notify their campuses if they choose to have their children okay. engage in remote learning. Um, so that communication will go straight to the campus uh, campuses. So every parent will have that choice. It is okay. a choice. Yes, All right. Sir. So every parent will have a choice uh, to to opt either to have your kids experience face to face instruction or to be completely virtual. That'll be the choice. And at some point, we'll, parents will need to notify their schools. We're not ready for that yet, but that 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 notification is coming, and we'll certainly communicate that with all parents uh, at, at a time that we'll need to know exactly how many. But we're but please know, moms and dads, that we're getting ready right now uh, for virtual learning pre K through twelfth grade. We also, you know, in the month of September or October, November, the, the coronavirus may ex spread in our community, and we may actually have to shut our doors physically again, um, like we did, you know, the month, uh, a few months ago. Um, but this time we could open up very quickly in a virtual environment because we will all be running a virtual environment. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the shift for our, our staff is not going to be so hard. Um, as it was with um, the spring closure, because we are going to prepare um, virtual uh, teacher handbooks. We will have the virtual uh, or the remote learning framework ready for you to go. And so we will work on training all of you how to utilize and to provide the assignments and to do your virtual instruction through the remote setting. Yeah. So we will be ready. Good. That's good. So a couple questions for our teachers. We uh, so thanks, teachers. We actually ha have a lot of teachers and, and other staff members that watch these each evening. So we'll um, kind of address some of those questions. One one question about teachers: uh, if we're asking our teachers to provide um, the technology or, or to broadcast their their learning experience, will we provide the tech support that teachers need in order to be successful in this environment? Yes, so uh, once we establish the platform that we'll be using for the, um, the virtual instruction, we will definitely provide a tech support for you, um, how-to videos, uh, all our professional development be, will be uh, wrapped around uh, providing you with all the support that you need to, to provide students with a quality experience. Good, but it's not going to be easy. I, I think you know we're really creating uh, multiple scenarios for our kids. Yes. Uh, teaching, first of all, it has never been easy. It's probably <laughs> one of the hardest jobs ever. And now we're asking our teachers, you know, to take on even more um, opportunity in this new world. And, and so thank you, teachers, for really keeping your minds open and being ready to learn because this is going to be very different uh, for all of us. Um, so some questions about uh, 
um, opportunity culture. There is an exciting, some people may not know what that is, uh, we have an exciting new uh, initiative that is starting in, in eight of our schools next year uh, in which teachers are going to take on some different roles. But the question is, scenario, if in a learning environment, if, if more than one teacher is required to be in a space, if two or three or four teachers are required to be in one space with a group of kids, uh, what, what will that look like? Will we have to make some adjustments? Um, we will make sure that, that we have the appropriate safe number within each learning space, but we definitely are able to stream in the quality in, ex, uh, instruction that the, like the multi-classroom leader yep. provides to students. So we can stream those into other classrooms oh. within the building yep. or within other Good. buildings. So it's kind of leveraging the technology even within the building. Yes. So yeah, and I, you know, it kind of goes back goes to another question that we're talking about a, a question from a teacher about being departmentalized or self-contained. Um, you know, some of these questions will be decided at the school level. So principals and teachers will make some of these decisions clearly on your own. Uh, but what's important is that that we will limit the movement of people in buildings next year, and some of the ways that we've been organized in the past may change because we've got to limit the movement of students, of students, limit the movement of teachers, really limit the movement of any adult or child in our campuses next year. That kind of goes to one of the next questions, which is about hallways. You know, we have some really large, ha large hallways. We have some uh, large schools, uh, and uh, the hallways don't seem very large when a bunch of kids are walking through them. Um, and we've had to think about that too. In fact, I think there's a whole committee that is focused on transitions, yes. So we have a whole team of people that are actually looking at how schools, how teachers and students will move in and around campus uh, next year. Um, but what, what you probably won't see next year is a bell rings and everybody dumps into the hallway and moves at the same time. <laughs> That's right. I think those days may be over and a new way of moving around campus uh, we may have to see uh, next year. So That's right. we'll, we'll look forward to that. But, but again, a whole committee of people is looking at transitions and how we can do those safely in uh, some very large schools uh, that have some very small hallways. That'll be an exciting right. opportunity. Um, um, I think it's exciting to think about, so if we are a departmentalized elementary um, grade level, um, teachers would be moving, the ones moving from uh, classroom to classroom. To, uh, yep. We will not be asking students to move Good. from classroom to classroom. So right. trying to limit student movement, yes. teachers may do the moving um, as opposed to students. That makes a lot of sense, yeah, absolutely. We've talked about uh, a little bit of that. Um, moving to the arts, so we have a question about the arts. What about uh, summer band programs? I know that the UIL has just released some information and some new guidance which continues to change daily. Do, do our band kids and, and others, even student athletes, do we have anything going on this summer? Uh, we do. We have uh, summer programs going on. We've got strength and conditioning programs going on. Um, there are guidelines that UIL and of course the CDC have um, established for us and we're doing yeah. our, you know, we're following those guidelines. Um, I know the students are just waiting to perform because that's yeah. what, you know, athlete, ath athletes love to play, yeah. uh, engage in their sport, and uh, any and all of the performing arts love to perform. Yeah. Um, and so we are definitely following the guidelines, uh, but it's really going to be an interesting shift as of right now. It is. Um, you know, one of the pieces of guidance, specifically with band and chorus, has been about the breathing that takes place. You know, many musical instruments, in fact, most musical instruments require uh, one to exhale right. uh, pretty, you know, pretty aggressively, which would cause all of your your breath and other germs, if you will, potentially viruses, to be spread. Right, especially those instruments, brass instruments with the spit valves uh -oh. and all of that. <laughs> no. But there is one <laughs> instrument that does not require any of that. So I did share this today with a group of our band teachers, and that is Everybody could be a percussionist. So if we were all drummers, we wouldn't have to worry about this. That's so not how it is. Is that, is that not the new answer? No. A band full of drummers. No. Well, I don't know. Although drum sounds, lines are awesome. Exactly. Sounds like a good idea to me. But I can assure that our band kids and, and orchestra students and um, vocalists, you know, that we will follow the UIL guidance. We will make sure our kids are safe. Uh, but but it, it kind of like, like you, you know, I want our kids to have all of those opportunities. I think that's important. Yes, in fact, I was talking to a mom yesterday whose daughter was a uh, panther paw, 
And so they're just hopeful, so hopeful that they'll be able to perform. And we will provide opportunities for groups to perform, um, but it's not going to be like we've seen mm -hmm. in the past, but we do uh, plan on scheduling performances Good. for the students. Good. Um, and like I said, it's important. It is and important. we recognize that and we want kids to have those opportunities, so we'll continue to do that. Um, so a, a question about self-quarantining. The question is, you know, will a student be counted absent if they have to self-quarantine? I think the exciting thing about virtual learning is uh, that if a student has to self-quarantine, they simply shift their face-to-face -face instruction to virtual instruction. So learning would continue at home. And that's, that's really the, one of the powerful elements right now. Um, as we develop virtual experiences, in fact, this may help us to address some other sicknesses, you know, other kids may miss school uh, for other reasons, other illnesses or, or, or potentially other, other situations, but virtual learning can now occur so the child would not be counted absent um, in a virtual environment because they would be learning. That's right. So whenever a student um, is in the virtual or the remote learning yep. environment, um, when they log in to, yep. say, Imagine Math, um, that records that they are actually engaged in the mm -hmm. content and when they complete an assignment, yep. ding, they get credit for being in attendance. Good, good, good. Or whenever they uh, submit an assignment through Google Classroom, or if they email the teacher an assignment during the day, ding, they get credit for being present. So, so you mean I couldn't just go to the beach when <laughs> I'm at home? No, we're going to have to really engage in learning. Okay, all right. And I think that's important to know, too. Um, we will, there'll be very specific attendance requirements for those students that are involved in virtual learning. There will be some attendance functions that we will exercise that will ensure when a child is learning at home that they're actually engaged in the learning process. So more information about that is forthcoming. Um, that would be a pretty interesting experience. All right. Um, so a, another question from a teacher. We have lots of, lots of teachers watching tonight. That's a good thing. So as a teacher and a parent, so this person, in fact, a lot of our teachers wear both hats. They have their own children, and, uh, and they also teach children. Uh, the question is about their personal children. So I'm a teacher, and what, how do I take care of my own children if I have to be at work? Well, we are prioritizing employees' children, not okay. just teachers, okay. but employees. Oh. So, um, you know, if I'm a food service person and I have school-age children that cannot, you know, they're too young to be okay. at home, um, or if we're custodians or bus drivers. So we are going to prioritize um, employees' children, and they will be invited to come to school face-to-face. -face. Good. That's good. So one of the priority groups we mentioned earlier, elementary kids. We mentioned kids of poverty, our special education students. So one of those other groups would be the children of employees. Yes, sir. Oh, good, good, good. That, that's important. Our, our, like you said, our, our employees have to go to work. And you can't leave your kids at home if, if, if indeed you need to go and teach children. So that's, right. that's important. Um, so a question about um, safety. We actually have several questions tonight regarding the safety of our kids. And, and that's important. Not only the safety of our students, but the safety of our staff members. We have 4,200 staff members. We have 34,000 kids. And when our kids walk into our buildings and our staff members walk in, they must be safe. Um, so several announcements there. One is the state of Texas has already made some purchases and those items are being shipped to us right now. Uh, we will have face coverings. Um, in fact, we, we've ordered over one million face coverings. Yes, that's one million, over one million face coverings. In fact, I think the number is 1.3 million face coverings that we'll have an ECISD to take care of our students, to take care of our staff members. We've ordered the plastic face shields. Uh, those will be in place. We've ordered uh, lots of gloves, so we'll have lots of gloves. Um, we've ordered hand sanitizer, you know, thousands of gallons of hand sanitizer has been ordered and will be, uh, will be prepared. We've ordered thermometers, uh, they're on their way as well, um, and all of those tools will be used to make sure that our kids are safe. We've got a whole team of people working on safety, in fact that is one of the committees that's a part of, of this task force, is to focus very specifically on safety. Uh, we must make sure that our students are safety are safe when they're attending school. We've got to make sure that our staff members are safe, and we will do everything within our power uh, to make sure that that happens. That's right. With all that said, um, there are still uh, opportunities for COVID-19 to insert itself onto our campuses. 
And, and in fact, even today, I got a phone call about another staff member who's been diagnosed with COVID-19. Mm. And we've had calls almost every day the last week or two about staff members uh, that have been diagnosed. And that causes us to take action. Um, it causes individuals to be quarantined. It causes us to uh, deep clean areas of our school district. It causes us to make some specific, some decisions that ensure that everyone else who is not being diagnosed with COVID-19 is indeed safe. Right. And so we will have a lot of safety measures in place uh, next year as we welcome students back and more about the safety measures is forthcoming. But I can assure you PPE uh, will be provided and we will uh, do the very best that we can to make sure that everybody uh, feels safe in sending your kids back. Alrighty. Um, a couple more uh, quick items that we wanted to hit tonight. One of them was about registration. We are welcoming uh, almost or actually over 1,000 pre-K students uh, to our school district next year. But there's something that our pre-K families need to do. What is yes. that? Yes. Um, so many of you have already completed a survey letting us know that you are very interested in uh, registering your children for pre-K. But the next step is for you to actually register. And so we are encouraging all the parents that, um, particularly the ones that are eligible for pre-K to, um, to get engaged in the registration process. So if you have questions about the registration process, you, Edith Sanchez has a lot of answers. She's excellent at supporting our families. But also your principals are okay. ready to welcome okay. you and, and, and to help you with that registration process. So not only, um, pre-K registration, but we really need all of our families all to of register. Our families and to so pre-K, we need to know, and other families, kindergarten through 12th grade, if you haven't take, taken an opportunity to either re-register your child for school or to enroll some families for the very first time, then that is something that our families need to do as quickly as we yes. can. So we'll know how many families to expect um, in the fall. In addition to that, transportation. Um, our transportation system is busy planning for the upcoming school year and they need to know how many kids are going to need buses and if you haven't yet registered for transportation and you need it uh, please make sure you do that all of that information is available on the ECISD website so you are welcome to visit the website and find out about registration so pre-k registration kindergarten through 12th grade registration or enrollment and a uh, bus uh, registration so make sure that parents that you take advantage of that and then spread the word we need to make sure that everybody um, is registered for school next year. Um, another piece that we wanted to talk about, um, we, we've made uh, some, we talked about some technology purchases. We purchased devices for kids to make sure that our kids have the tools they need. But we've also partnered with some interesting folks to bring some really exciting digital products to our kids next year. In fact, yesterday we announced a brand new partnership with... Discovery Education. Yeah, so tell us about that. Uh, Discovery Education uh, is a platform where we're able to supplement uh, all our core uh, areas um, and they provide such wonderful uh, digital resources such as virtual field trips. Um, uh, just the other day I logged in, we're actually using Discovery Education for our summer school right now. I logged into a classroom and we were touring the uh, Statue of Liberty. There you go. And so, um, Along with that partnership comes uh, professional development um, and embedded coaching. Yep. You know, research shows that adults learn best when the training is done Good. embedded within the job. So we've got that uh, in the Good. works, and we're just so excited about that partnership. Good. We're going to be able to supplement yeah. with such rich content. So outstanding tool, those teachers that are watching tonight. The, the tool is for pre-K through 12th grade, yes. so it's available for everybody. And I heard embedded coaching teachers, as you think about developing digital lessons next year and providing some virtual instruction for teachers, um, you may have an experience to have some uh, embedded coaching from a, a discovery education expert who provides uh, that opportunity for you. So that's a really great opportunity. And actually, there's one more thing that they're providing uh, right now on the CW, uh, two days a week, Discovery Education is providing all of the Dis Discovery Channel uh, programming has been available on the CW during those uh, ECISD broadcast hours. And so thank you, Discovery, for making all of this uh, possible. We're excited about that new yeah. partnership. And I think you've made some other purchases uh, <laughs> this summer. So teachers, students, and families, uh, some really exciting digital tools that are coming our way next year. And uh, I'm excited for our kids, and, and I've actually done a little bit of playing myself. So 
I haven't been to the Statue of Liberty, so I might have to check out that field trip. Right. So that's interesting. Right. Oh, Very good, exciting. good, good. All righty. Um, I uh, I've looked scanning questions. I don't see you. So one question from a New Tech student. So if I'm at New Tech and I have an elective at a high school, have we solved that issue yet? Um, we're actually working on okay. that. So we we're, we're working. Uh, the scheduling team uh, and transportation team are really okay. uh, exploring those. Th those are opportunities for us to really engage in. Yeah, during the school year, we actually have quite a few of our high school kids. In fact, kids that travel to New Tech, uh, they travel from New Tech. Our high schools send kids to different places. So there's a lot of student travel in our system that we're that we've have to rethink because we want to try to keep movement to a minimum as right. long as the virus is around. That also includes our career and technical education students, you know, that travel to the Frost Building for our welding courses, um, our welding labs, um, our construction labs, our horticulture labs, yep. uh, the farm. Um, so we do have a lot, our auto tech uh, over Good. at the, the new facility, the Sewell facility. So we are we are currently working on those plans right now. Good. All righty. Thank you, Dr. Nunez, for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thank you. Final couple, a couple of final words. If you're interested in, in uh, seeing the calendar, again, it's posted on the ECISD website, so you can certainly make your way there and see the, the calendar that our board approved on Tuesday night. If you have additional questions or thoughts about the calendar, you can certainly visit the website. Um, all of our conversations uh, that happened tonight, the things that we referenced, all of that information can be found on the ECISD website, and you can uh, ensure to visit that uh, next week. We have at seven o'clock. Uh, we have a virtual graduation, so we'll make uh, an announcement about our Facebook Live date and time for next week. As next Thursday night, we will be experiencing uh, a graduation uh, ceremony for our summer graduates in a different environment. But again, more information in the coming days about next week's uh, Facebook Live experience. So I'm Scott Murray, Superintendent ECISD. Thank you for.